Does everybody come to order, please? Dr. Meyer. Good afternoon. I'd like to start asking you a few questions about your educational background. Where did you receive your undergraduate degree? I received a BA from Tel Aviv University. I received a BA uh, from Tel Aviv University in psychology and uh, special education. You have a master's degree. Yes, I uh, received a master's degree in psychology from the New School for social research in New York City. Did you do a pre-doctoral fellowship of any kind? Yes, after the master's degree, I uh, moved to a doctoral program at Columbia University. And during this program, I had a uh, National Institute of Mental Health Fellowship in Psychiatric Epidemiology. What is psychiatric epidemiology? Psychiatric epidemiology is the study of mental disorders. Uh, we're interested in patterns of mental disorders, causes of mental disorders, risks for mental disorders, very much like epidemiology of infectious diseases where we're looking at the infections, uh, but this is concerning psychiatric disorders such as depression, anxiety, so forth. Dr. Meyer, do you have a PhD? I do. From where did you receive it? From Columbia University. When did you receive it? In uh, 1993. And in what field did you receive your PhD? Uh, the department where I got the PhD is called Sociomedical Sciences. It's a department that um, brings together people from various social sciences and studying of public health problems or public health issues. In my case, mental disorders but other people may study other types of disorders. And did you do a doctoral dissertation? I did. What was the title of it? The title was uh, Prejudice and Pride, Minority Stress and Mental Health in Gay Men. Did it receive any awards? It was uh, chosen for distinction by the university, which is uh, given to <coughs> the top 10% of dissertations in, at the university, Columbia University. Do you do any postdoctoral fellowship? I did, after finishing my PhD, I did uh, three years of postdoctoral uh, work. Uh, they were funded also by the National Institute of he uh, Health, or NIH. Um, the first one was a two year postdoctoral fellowship at City University of New York, the Graduate Center, and that was in health psychology. The second one was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and that was in HIV AIDS and psychiatry. Dr. Meyer, let's talk a bit about your employment. Um, what's your current employment position? I'm an associate <coughs> professor at the Department of Sociomedical Sciences, the same department where I graduated. I'm also the deputy chair for the department in charge of our master's program, which has about 100 students a year uh, entering to this master's degree. And this is at Columbia University? Exactly. At the Mailman School of Public Health? Yes. Do you chair any programs uh, within your department? Yes. As, uh, well, first, I, I co-chair uh, what we call the steering committee for the school, uh, uh, entire school, that is the, the School of Public Health. And the steering committee is a faculty committee that uh, represents the uh, academic and other issues that the um, faculty has in terms of uh, the direction of the school and in terms of programs and so forth. So we, uh, so I'm a co-chair of that uh, committee. I also chair the departmental committee on MPH, Masters of Public Health degree. As I said, I'm in charge of that program. 
Uh, I'm also involved or, or, or sit in our curriculum committee, which is the committee that determines what uh, uh, the students should learn in terms of uh, 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 receiving their degrees. Um, I probably have some other committees that I uh, am on. Uh, that's quite a bit of a... <laughs> <laughs> that's a good start. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what year did you join the faculty of Columbia University? Uh, my first appointment uh, in 94, uh, but that was while I was still doing my postdoctoral degree, but I think my full-time appointment is in uh, 96. Been there consistently. So, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the work that you do professionally. Um, has your professional, let me step back, it's been close to 20 years since you got your doctorate? <coughs> it is. Uh, has the professional work you've done over that period focused on any particular topics? Yes, um, my area of study I would define as um, social epidemiology. Um, th th there are terms that are, are maybe not that self-explanatory, but if I had to explain it, I, I study um, the relationship between social issues, social factors in our the structure of our society and the way things uh, 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 happen in our society and health patterns, health outcomes, and, and specifically mental health outcomes. Um, and that's within the field of social epidemiology? That's within the field, I guess, of uh, psychiatric epidemiology, and social epidemiology would be one approach within that field. Let me see if I have that. Your area of study is the relationship of social structures and mental health outcomes. Yes within psychiatric epidemiology, which um, broad, more broadly uh, discusses and studies patterns and causes of mental disorders. Dr. Meyer, uh, could you please tell the court, has your work focused on any particular groups of the population? Yes, most directly I've been studying lesbian, gay, and bisexual populations within this area. I've also studied other populations um, I've studied uh, uh, African Americans, I've studied uh, other issues such as asthma and HIV, but most of my work has been on lesbian, gay, bisexuals and mental health issues. Have you made any uh, presentations at professional conferences in the course of your work? <laughs> yes, I've made many uh, presentations. Um, I think uh, m most of them are listed in my CV, but maybe not all the major ones. I, I would say there were like over 40 listed there. Have you received any research grants, sir? Yes, I've received uh, funding for my research. Uh, currently, I'm a recipient of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's um, Health Policy Investigator Award. Uh, I've received in the past uh, grants from the National Institutes of Health and the National Library of Medicine from uh, New York State uh, Department of Health, from private foundations, et cetera. Have you received any awards for your professional work? I have. What are some of them? <laughs> um, well, I guess most recently I received an award for distinguished, sci distinguished scientific contribution from the American Psychological Association's Division 44, which is a division of the American Psychological Association that concerns gay, lesbian, and bisexual health. Have you been a reviewer or editor of any publications? Many times. Um, that's part of what we do. I've reviewed many uh, uh, manuscripts that were to be published and uh, would, would, would assess there for their value and recommend to the editor uh, uh, about the, the, and, and critique the, the manuscripts and so forth. I've also uh, been a guest editor uh, on a, a couple of journals. Uh, a, a major one was when I was invited to guest edit uh, the American Journal of Public Health special issue on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health. This was the first issue that was published on the topic by uh, the American Journal of Public Health, which is a very prestigious uh, uh, journal. Uh, it's been around for, I would say, close to 100 years. And it was a very successful issue. 
Uh, it actually is the first issue that sold out in the memory of anybody, <laughs> which is a very rare thing for a scientific uh, journal. <laughs> um, Not the highest circulation. No. And um, after that, I um, g edited or co-edited another journal. Um, this is a, again, this is a special issue of a journal. So the journal is published regularly, but I, in this case, edited a special issue of American Journal of Public Health. And uh, the second one was the a journal that's called Soci Social Science and Medicine. In that case, I uh, co-edited uh, with two uh, colleagues a special issue that focused on prejudice and stigma and their impact and, uh, in public health and, and different issues within public health of how we should uh, think about prejudice and stigma. Have you edited any books, sir? Yes, I, um, in part because of the success uh, of the American Journal of Public Health <coughs> issue, I was invited by editors in a Springer publication. At the time it was Clure, and they asked me to uh, edit a book on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender public health issues, which I did uh, with a co-editor also. And have you written any articles? Yes, I have written uh, uh, articles, uh, both peer-reviewed articles and articles <coughs> that were more of a commentary or editorial nature uh, and chapters uh, and so forth. Uh, can you approximate how many articles you've written? I think uh, there are 44 peer-reviewed articles listed on my CV right now, uh, and m m maybe 12 uh, uh, other types, commentaries, and so forth. Dr. Meyer, do you teach students as part of your position at Columbia? Yes. Um, what courses do you teach? Currently, I teach uh, three courses, not, not at the same time, but there are three courses that I currently teach. Um, the first one is a course on research methodology, uh, such as how to conduct surveys uh, and things like that. The, the, that's a, a required course for our students. There are also two um, seminars that I teach. Uh, one is called uh, Prejudice, Stigma, and discrimination as social stressors. And the other one is a course on gay and lesbian issues in public health. Dr. Meyer, you have a, a witness binder in front of you. If you could turn to the very last tab, which is plaintiff's exhibit number 2328. Yes. <clears throat> and if you could take a look at that document. That's my CV. That's your CV. That was my question. Your Honor, plaintiffs would tender Dr. Elon Meyer as an expert in public health with a focus on social psychology and psychiatric epidemiology. All right, dear. No objection to him being qualified to offer his opinions, I gather. No objection to being qualified as an expert. Very well. And, Your Honor, with respect to the exhibits to try and keep things efficient, what we've done is counsel and I have agreed on a list of documents that will be admitted together. I understand that list has been provided to you and to the clerk. And I'm happy to read them if it would be better for you, but we could just agree. I suspect it's not. Uh, we could agree that those documents will be admitted. This is five pages. Uh, it's 49 um, exhibits, I believe. 49 exhibits. If there is no objection, each of these will be admitted. No objection. Very well. Thank you, counsel, for facilitating that. I appreciate that. Um, and Dr. Meyer, I want to ask you just two straightforward questions about those exhibits that were just admitted into evidence. Um, with the exception of three of them, which are exhibits 973, 975, and 976, is it true that each of the documents that has just been admitted into evidence and it's in your binder is a document that you've relied on in forming the opinions that you intend to offer in this case? Yes, based on my examination of this uh, previously, yes. And the three exhibits that I mentioned, 973, you can take a look at them if you'd like, 973, 975, and 976, those are documents that came up in the course of your deposition testimony in this case and that were referenced by you in that testimony? 
Yes, what was the third one? I'm sorry. 976. Okay. Um, yes, that is correct. Now, Dr. Meyer, do you intend to offer any opinions in this litigation here today? Yes, I do. Um, what opinions do you intend to offer? Well, my uh, opinion uh, really um, describes the work that I've been doing, uh, as I described it earlier, uh, and I'd say there are three elements there. Uh, the first one is on the nature of stigma, and uh, I will um, testify to the effect of stigma on gay and lesbian populations. And with reference to Proposition 8 as an example of a stigma. Uh, the second part will uh, describe uh, a model of minority stress. That is a model that I um, accredited with, with um, authoring and uh, has been referred to in uh, much of the literature on gay and lesbian health, and I will describe how uh, uh, social stressors affect gay and lesbian populations. And the third part uh, describes the effect of those stressors on health, in particular mental health. And on what do you base the opinions that you're going to testify about today? As I've said, this is a topic of my study for, as you said, for the past 20 years, uh, really since my work on my dissertation. Uh, and uh, the opinion is based on uh, many research uh, articles, uh, both some uh, that I've conducted myself and many more that were conducted in the field uh, over many years. And um, I rely on, on this body of evidence. Uh, a sample of it, I guess, would be uh, what you offered as exhibit, which is what I relied on in uh, writing a report uh, earlier. So Dr. Meyer, let's start talking in a little more detail about each of these opinions. Let's start with the first, which you said refers to uh, stigma experienced by gay men and lesbians. Can you define what you mean by stigma as you use that word? Yes, and uh, I have to say that I have to be a, a very uh, a brief in this description. The work on stigma uh, has many, many volumes that I'm sure you don't want. Uh, it's, as I said, it's the subject of a whole seminar that I teach. But the most uh, succinct, I guess, description would be that a group in society has uh, some kind of attribute that has been identified to be a negative attribute that is seen as negative by society. And this attribute uh, is attached to persons who are believed to have this attribute. And because of having this attribute, they're therefore uh, what we call devalued. Uh, so in the example of gay uh, or sexual orientation, sexual orientation is identified as such an attribute that people perceive as being a negative attribute. And uh, therefore, gay and lesbian people as a whole uh, I don't mean as a whole, the whole person uh, is identified by that identity that is devalued and therefore the whole person is devalued because of that relationship. And stigma, of course, has been applied to many other populations and instances. Are you familiar with a concept referred to as structural stigma? Yes. What is structural stigma? The structural stigma refers to, in a sense, the origins of stigma and the mechanisms that uh, maintain and, and, and uh, enact stigma. So those uh, refer, by the word structural, we mean uh, to more solid structures in society, uh, societal institutions, uh, such as, of course, the law being a, a, an important one, and any other uh, institution that, that is central in our society. Explain a little more, if you would, for the court, the way that laws can play a role in structural stigma. Well, st uh, laws have a major role in determining uh, um, access of different uh, of the citizens to to different we call it goods that society can provide uh, to resources i guess would be the word and um, laws may block or foster access to such resources in that sense they enact perhaps uh, uh, for a group that is stigmatized uh, um, 
or rather control the access that various groups may have to a particular institution. So, of course, here we're talking about marriage, and that would be an example of, uh, in this case, a very important inst uh, institution of marriage, and, of course, the law uh, has a role in determining who can access that institution. And, and again, that would be applicable to other types of examples. So once a social, uh, excuse me, a structural stigma is in place, how does it affect people? So, so as I said, structural stigmas determine the access that people have to those uh, uh, resources. Um, I rely on a sociologist that talked about the opportunity structure. So society uh, lays out goals that people, um, f I don't want to say follow, to internalize. People, people uh, want to achieve certain goals that we all view as uh, important goals in our lives, such as career and marriage being two important examples of that. And stigma would, as I said, determine the access that people have to those desired goals, to achieving those desired goals. And has the research found that there are stigmas associated with gay men and lesbians? Yes, of course. And what are some examples of such stigma? Um, th there are really many stigmas and stereotypes that, that describe kind of how people are perceived. Uh, in my work, I've written uh, about the role of intimate relationships and the way intimate relationships have been portrayed. And part of the stereotype on, that is part of the stigma, the negative attitude or negative associations with this group has been for many years that gay people are uh, un incapable of, of relationships, of intimate relationship. They're, they're maybe undesiring even of intimate relationship. And it's certainly they're not successful at, at having intimate relationships. And, and when I say this has been a kind of social stigma, I'm talking about how it has been portrayed in various cultural and, and uh, outlets as well as in a more organized way in, in various uh, uh, social uh, interactions social institutions. And you use the phrase intimate relationships. What do you mean by that? Uh, intimate relationships means uh, relationships that uh, people have. Of course, a, a primary among them would be something like a marriage, a husband and a wife, uh, but also other intimate relationships with one's family, uh, one's children, and one's community. And in all of those, again, there's been people have been described uh, for many years as, as um, social isolate, as, as unconnected, as un, uh, not as, as, as um, uh, good citizens in a sense who partake in society in the same way that everybody else uh, as a pariah, so to speak. So, so that's what stigma does. And, and in, in particular for gay and lesbian uh, example, um, I think the issue of intimate relationship because of the nature of what being gay is about who you're uh, choose to be with, that has been a, a strong source of uh, stigma. Dr. Meyer, if you could turn in your binder to Plaintiff's Exhibit 1011, please. <coughs> yes. And this is one of the documents that you've relied on informing your opinions? Yes. Um, what is uh, Exhibit 1011? Uh, this is a chapter from a book that I've uh, relied on and that I've um, used in, in teaching as an example of, uh, uh, maybe I should say what in the book is. So this is a chapter from a book that was published in the 60s, late 60s, and was a very popular book. It was called uh, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. Um, it was a very, very... Uh, um, Popular. It was published in, in many. I have a hard uh, cover edition that is the 17th edition of this book that was published in 1969. So, I, I, and I personally remember that book. So, um, in this book, there are uh, different chapters that um, that that aim uh, to educate the public about different issues uh, concerning sexuality. And this particular chapter is concerning male homosexuality. And this is a book that had wide distribution. Absolutely. <clears throat> All 
I'm going to ask you about this, but what I'd like to do is just read the text into the record <coughs> so it's clear what you're addressing. May, may I explain something about this? Of course. This? I'm sorry. Uh, so the book is written in a question and answer format, and basically the author goes through explaining sexual issues uh, as, as, a, as if there is a question that somebody is asking him about uh, his opinion about various sexual issues, and then he provides the answer. So this is an excerpt that of one of those question and answers. So the question posed is, what about all the homosexuals who live together happily for years? And the answer is, what about them? They are mighty rare birds among the homosexual flock. Moreover, the, quote, happy, close quote, part remains to be seen. The bitterest argument between husband and wife is a passionate love sonnet by comparison with a dialogue between a butch and his queen. Live together? Yes. Happily? Hardly. Is this text from this book an example of the stigma that you're talking about, sir? Yes, I think this is a very dramatic experience of what I was referring to, where uh, in this case an educational book uh, portrays the relationship between, uh, uh, in this case, gay men as uh, w with uh, uh, great disrespect, I would say ridicule uh, uh, and, say, and, and uh, contempt. So, that was the kind of uh, uh, and one example of the, what I was referring to. At what stage in life does stigma begin to affect uh, gay men and lesbians? Well, stigma really affects all people in society because it is a social norm, if you will. It is something that we all in society learn from a very young age. Uh, it affects gay and lesbian. This particular stigma affects gay and lesbian, uh, sorry, gay men and lesbians, in a particular way because it is about something that is very pertinent to uh, how they think about who they are. Uh, in my mind, this kind of uh, uh, stigma or other stereotypes uh, are very impactful, especially at the younger age, and in particular in a time of life where uh, gay men and lesbian, usually during youth, uh, um, either realize or recognize or, or know that they're gay and begin to try to understand what that means to them. And, and of course, the most available reference that they would have is the kind of things that they've learned uh, over their lifetime, over their childhood socialization that we all have been exposed to. So it affects everybody, but certainly it affects in a very uh, strong way somebody who is maybe coming out and realizing that he or she is gay and, and that's what they might believe uh, is what is in line for them. Now, Dr. Meyer, you live in New York, correct? That's true. Are you familiar with Proposition 8, the ballot initiative that was passed in California? Yes, I am. And what's your basic understanding of what Proposition 8 did? Proposition 8 was a proposition that was voted by voters in California and um, restricted marriage to um, a man and a woman, in no. fact, excluding gay men and lesbians from marriage. And it was a, an, a constitutional amendment to the California Constitution. In your view, based on your work in this field, is Proposition 8 a form of structural stigma? Yes, absolutely. As I described stigma earlier, uh, I would say that law and certainly a constitutional part of the law would be a very strong uh, part of, as I described, the social structures that define stigma, that define access and in a very uh, uh, simple way, you can think of it as a block or, or, or gate toward a particular uh, institution, toward attaining a particular goal. So in that sense, it is uh, very much fitting in the definition of structural stigma. And in what ways does Prop 8 impose structural stigma on gay men and lesbians in California? Well, it, Im it imposes it, uh, by the fact that it denies them access to the institution of marriage. Uh, as I said, um, people in our society have goals that are cherished by, by all people. Again, that's part of social convention that we all uh, grow up raised and to think that there are certain things that we want to achieve in life. And in this case, uh, this Proposition 8, uh, in fact, says that if you're gay or lesbian, you cannot achieve this particular goal. 
Now, are you aware, sir, that in California, gay and lesbian couples can register as a domestic partnership? Yes, I am. In your view, does that eliminate the structural stigma of Prop 8? No. Why not? When I um, talk about um, a pr Proposition 8 and the institution of marriage, I'm talking about an institution that has a social meaning. Uh, as I described it, this has to do with the aspirations of people to achieve certain goals. And um, I was not referring, and I, I continue, I don't refer the, to any tangible benefit that maybe are accompanying marriage or a domestic partnership arrangement. So my, my, what I'm talking about throughout my work and, and today is really about the symbolic meaning, the, the social meaning of marriage. It is, um, I think, quite clear that, 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 that the young children do not aspire to be domestic partners, but certainly the word marriage is something that uh, many people aspire to. It doesn't mean that everybody achieves that, but it is a, at least I would say it's a, it's a very common social, uh, socially approved goal for people as they think, of, for children as they think about their future and for people as they develop relationships, uh, for young people and certainly for people later on. This is a, a, a desirable and, and, and respected type of um, goal that you, if you attain it, it's something that gives you pride and, and respect. You have an opinion as to whether domestic partnerships enjoy similar symbolic and social meaning? Uh, I have an opinion, and that is that, as I said, I don't think it has the same social meaning. In fact, I don't know if it has any social meaning. I think it has perhaps value in terms of the types of benefits that people receive, but as I was trying to explain, that is not what I'm dis talking about, and that's not really relevant to my discussion of stigma. Let's turn then to the second opinion you mentioned, which had to do with minority stress. Uh, what does minority stress mean as you use that phrase? Minority stress, um, <laughs> I've written a lot of articles about it, so I'm trying to, uh, again, be pithy. But uh, it basically describes the types of stressors, which is I have to try to explain maybe what stress means before I do that, is it? Well, let me break it down. Why don't you tell us what stress means? Okay, so that's perhaps something that's easier to understand. Uh, stress is, well, everybody knows what stress means, but when we talk about stress, what we talk about is the kinds of events and conditions that happen from the outside to the person and that one of the main definitions is that they bring about some kind of change that require adaptation. In that sense, they're taxing on the person because it requires the person to adjust, so to speak, to this new situation. Uh, one of the strongest types of stressors is a life event, and certainly losing a loved one would be a very uh, a, a high magnitude type of an event. Uh, losing a job is another example of an event. So those are the general, I've referred to those as general stressors just because I'm trying to distinguish from the minority stress model that I have written about in regards to gay and lesbian uh, stressors. So, so there's those different, and there are different ways that we think about stress, not just life events, but for example, also there are chronic stressors, uh, so, for example, the unemployment or prolonged, so that, so, and there are other types that maybe I can explain well, later Let's, if you let's want. talk a bit about the types. I think, I believe you referenced acute stress. What would that mean? Right. So, so a life event is an acute stressor. That's something that has a beginning and end that is uh, pretty easily discernible. It happened. Uh, and, and chronic stress is something that, as I said, is prolonged. There is Obviously, there could be a relationship between the two, so losing a job would be a life event, but unemployment that would result from that would be a chronic stress, so they're not totally distinguished. There are other types of stressors that uh, people have written about, and again, this is in general that is affecting everybody. Another one would be um, what we sometimes call daily hassles or minor stressors. Uh, that are just annoyances that happen to people, maybe being stuck in traffic for a long time or, or uh, being in long line in a bank or 
if people still go to banks or, or in, in, <laughs> in um, a supermarket, I guess. So, so those will be just daily kind of hassles. And uh, there is another type of uh, stress that is a little different um, and maybe a little harder to understand as why it is a stress. Uh, and those have been termed non-events, which means <laughs> nothing happened. And the reason that why a non-event can be stressful is because it is something that was expected to have happened. So that, this, that the fact that it didn't happen in this case also requires adaptation or adjustment. So for example, if I've been working in my job for a certain number of years and I expected after a certain amount of time I would receive a promotion, but I didn't receive that promotion, that could be an, a, a non-event in a sense because nothing happened, but it was something that I expected and, and, and by the way, and others expected. It's not just any kind of expectation. So, so uh, you know, if I bought a lottery ticket and I didn't get the prize, that will not be the same type. It is, it is something that is, is uh, normative to expect to happen at a particular time. Usually we're talking about uh, uh, milestones over a lifetime, and certainly marriage will be one of those types of uh, uh, expected events, having children. Uh, if you ask little children, that will be uh, the kind of thing that they will tell you about what might happen to them in the future. I would marry, I would have children, I would be a grandparent, or things like that that are easily understood in our society as so are, are the stressors of the type that you're talking about essentially inputs on people's lives as opposed to the result that they may experience? I'm sorry, yes. So, so those are the, so in the research lingo, I guess we would call those the independent factor. Those are the things that happen from the outside. But in common language, usually when we talk about stress, we think about also the outcome, what we call, which is I felt stress, means usually I, I felt some kind of distress because of something that happened. We try to separate those two, so we try to assess the stressor part, the, the input, and the outcome that, that resulted from that stressor, which may, and of course in, in this case, uh, we study health outcomes. So now that we've discussed stress, Let's go back to this concept of minority stress. Okay, so what is minority stress? So minority stress is um, an expansion of this notion of stress in that it identifies a source of stress that stems, as I described earlier, from social arrangements, in particular prejudice, stigma, and discrimination. So in my model, any stress that is related to stigma, prejudice, and discrimination, I would designate it as a minority stressor. And by the way, it could be the exact same type of stressor. So for example, losing a job, as I said, is a life event, but losing a job due to discrimination is a minority stressor of the same life event. And the reason that we distinguish those two is because we know that there's different impact for those types of events, and also because um, this is allows us to, to assess and measure them, I guess, in a way that is more uh, precise for this purpose of understanding these issues of social determinants. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Could, could you turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 1003 in your binder? <coughs> Yes. And if you would tell the court what is Exhibit 1003. This is an article uh, or, uh, that was published that I've written. And what's the subject of it? Uh, so the title of this article is Prejudice, Social Stress, and Mental Health in Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Populations, Conceptual Issues, and Research Evidence. I published this in 2003 in the journal Psychological Bulletin, which I may add is a very prestigious journal in the field of psychology uh, and quite difficult to get published there. Uh, and um, this article, I, s I would say, best articulates the model of minority stress that I've written about. And it has been uh, referred to by many uh, other researchers uh, who, who've used it to, to 
as a theoretical background for their own studies. Uh, so, in fact, there are several hundred studies that result, well, I wouldn't say resulted, but certainly that, that have used this article, the ideas in this article, as a, as a resource for their own research. Now, does the scholarship on minority stress address minority groups other than gay men and lesbians? Um, well, certainly the principles, uh, I have to explain maybe something about how I got to this idea of minority stress and just to uh, um, not to take too much credit maybe. So the ideas behind this theory that are uh, outlined here in this article are not all brand new ideas that I just made up or came up with for this purpose of this article. Rather, they rely on many, many years of research. So for example, all the research on stress and life events and so forth, I did not invent that. That has been going on, I would <coughs> say, uh, uh, since the 1950s, people began to be interested in life events as a source of stress and as its, it, its, out, its sorry, impact on health. So what I have done is articulated this within this particular um, context of gay, lesbian, and bisexual populations. So the literature on gay, lesbian, and bisexual population have use this term, minority stress, which I, uh, by the way, also did not invent, uh, but use somebody else's, uh, this was a term that I read about in a dissertation that was written on lesbians and, men and mental, sorry, and life events, and I thought it was a good term. By the term, by the word minority here, I mean sexual minorities, uh, which is a term that is used to describe gay, lesbian, gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals. Uh, so this refers to gay, lesbian, and bisexual, as you will see later, most of the things in it are quite specific to gay men and lesbians. But the general theories behind it apply to bro in broader ways. So let, let's talk a bit more specifically about it. Um, are there particular processes through which minority stress manifests itself or can manifest itself in the lives of gay men and lesbians? Yes, so... What are those? So this has been, I would say, my main contribution is to articulate what, are, what do we exactly mean by that when we say that prejudice and stigma has an impact on people. And I describe those as processes that... Um, describe what actually happens, why, why is that a stressor? And I've described in this article and in other work uh, four types of minority stress processes. The first one I've called prejudice events. The second, oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you articulate what the four are and then I'd like to do a little more detail on each. So if you could just generally describe what the four are. Okay, the, so the first one is called prejudice events which encompasses a bunch of concepts. Uh, the second one is uh, called expectations of rejection and discrimination. The third one is concealing, which refers to uh, uh, hiding your sexual orientation in this case, or not being out as we say sometimes. And the fourth one is <coughs> internalized homophobia, which refers to the internalization of social attitudes by a gay person or a lesbian. Now, how did you identify these processes? So, as I said, uh, uh, there has been work on each of those topics that I re relied on that work to bring it together to this model that is uh, uh, maybe more concise. So, while there were work on prejudice, uh, sorry, on life events, and there has been certainly a lot of work, for example, on internalized homophobia, uh, r raging to clinical psychological literature. I, I gathered together those different sources of research and theory to put it together in this particular form to explain the experiences of gay men and lesbians. Well, let's start with the first one you identified, prejudice events. What do you mean by prejudice events? So just as I described earlier, the general stress, prejudice events I refer to the types of stressors that are related to prejudice. So I already gave an example of being fired due to discrimination. That would be a prejudice event. And this, in this case, sorry, the prejudice events 
echo those four types of stressors that I mentioned earlier. So that will be the major events, the chronic, the major acute events, the chronic stress, the um, uh, minor events, we could call them, the daily hassles, and the non-events. So that, that is basically taking, again, the same framework and using it here uh, in this context. I should say, all of this was not as well packaged, so it's not that I just took all of this and copied it into this. I, I, I used a lot of research to, to develop this. Uh, Dr. Meyer, are the events that you describe as prejudice events different from stress events that may be faced by the rest of the population? Yes, by definition, they're uh, uh, related to prejudice. And can you give some more specific examples of prejudice events? Yes. So in addition to the example that I gave that has to do with events related to discrimination, that would include uh, other types of events that people experience. For example, anti-gay violence would be clearly a prejudice event, even though it's not a discrimination, but it is uh, uh, like hate crimes would be prejudice events in the sense that the person was chosen for this to be, to be the victim of this crime uh, because of prejudice. Um, so, so these are the major events. Then there are, there are chronic stressors, uh, again, that could be resultant from uh, um, prejudice. In my studies, uh, for example, I've collected data from in a recent study about 400 gay men and lesbians and and we asked them about life events that happened to them over their entire life we have several many thousands of life events that each of them describes so uh, uh, there will be chronic things like harassment that children report, uh, sorry, that uh, uh, they were adults who reported that during their childhood they've been harassed at school. So that's not an event uh, unless there was an event. <laughs> so we assess each of those for, for what happened and how it happened. But if somebody says, you know, people called me name over an entire year that I was in, in, in third grade, that we would <coughs> talk about it as a chronic stressor. Uh, if somebody said I walked down the street and, and, and somebody jumped and, and, and attacked me and beat me up, that will be an event, in this case a, a, a hate crime probably, but a, a event related to uh, prejudice. Um, there, so, that, so those are the life events. Um, there, Can I ask a follow-up question? Do, do, they, do prejudice events differ in magnitude based on the research? So. When we say magnitude, we mean how big the event was, and uh, usually what this means is like how much, going back to the definition in a more technical way, how much change did such an event require, how much adaptation. So uh, there, that's why I said uh, losing a job is a very big event, uh, uh, maybe, um, well, certainly the minor events I described, waiting on a line is a very tiny magnitude. But um, there's another aspect to prejudice event which has been identified, for example, with hate crimes, which is that they have a greater impact psychologically on the person, on the victim of hate crime, uh, and that greater impact has to be, has to do, sorry, has to do not so much with the characteristics of the event, but with the social meaning of the event. So, and, and, and I don't want to, to uh, or talk in this room about anything legal, but um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, hate crimes uh, uh, was challenged in as a whether it could be constitutional, and one of the reasons why, uh, my understanding, that the Supreme Court allowed it to be a separate crime is in fact because of that added social meaning and the added pain so that even though it's the same exact crime or the same exact event, um, when it is attached to prejudice and discrimination and stigma, it has a meaning for the victim that makes it uh, worse. And, 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 and that's how we, we describe it here as well. What has the research shown about who commonly uh, perpetrates these prejudice events in the lives of gay men and lesbians? So um, when I talk about, well, perpetrates, um, really 
as I described before, I talked about the different levels of, you can say, uh, 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 causes of those events. Of, of the, so at the larger level uh, is really the way I described earlier, structural stigma. We sometimes talk about structural uh, uh, prejudice in a similar way. Those are the things that would determine <coughs> there would be the context for, for example, events. So. Uh, an event usually is within a larger context, so we look at both of those. Uh, so a person, so those are the structural, and then there are things that we call interpersonal uh, types of events. So the perpetrators might be, uh, uh, on one hand, the state, for example, by, by creating certain structures, uh, but of course uh, it could, it, it is also individuals who do something, to, so, so in the example of a hate crime is the, the perpetrator. Uh, in the case of gay men and lesbians uh, or sexual minorities, um, this is quite distinct from other groups that when we think about prejudice, uh, unfortunately often the perpetrators could be family members, uh, uh, even parents and siblings, and, and some of the stories that uh, we've collected, we collect them as short narratives, uh, has been quite uh, um, uh, dramatic in terms of what some of those respondents reported in terms of what had happened to them in the past. Uh, this is, by the way, one of the uh, publications here. And um, uh, what was, well, I don't know if I would say surprising, but what was uh, um, uh, distinctive about it is how many of them reported family members perpetrating such uh, uh, crimes, really. There would be things like rape or homelessness uh, that some of them described. So, so, so there is a whole range of potential perpetrators uh, that could be implicated here in what I'm discussing. Now, from some of those very serious examples, you also mentioned earlier, I think, a concept of everyday hassles. And yes. Are those also prejudice events? So in the prejudice uh, uh, um, literature, we call these um, daily hassles, uh, well, some people have called them everyday discrimination events. That's one word. There are other, other terms that have been used to describe those. And in the same way that a hate crime is more significant because of its social meaning that is attached to it, a minor event could have a greater meaning than a similar event that, sorry, it could have a greater impact than a similar event that had no such meaning. Uh, uh, so one could be just an annoyance and the other one uh, could be uh, or, or is representing a social disapproval. And obviously they would be felt by the person as two dif very different so give us, if you would, a, a couple examples of daily hassles that the research has looked at within the context of prejudice events. Well, um, th there are many, but interestingly, um, I've read the plaintiff's testimony here, um, I believe on Monday it was, I, I mean I read it on Tuesday, but the testimony was given on Monday. and. I was really struck because one of the things that we hear over and over is forms, filling out forms. And it is kind of bewildering because on one hand you might say, what's the big deal about filling out a form? But, but, but gay people do respond to that. And the only way that I can explain it is that it is really not anything about the form. It is that the form evokes something much larger for the person. It evokes a social disapproval, a rejection, and often it evokes memories of such events, including large events that had happened maybe in the past. So it is this minor uh, annoyance most of the time for most people to fill out a form, and they probably would never remember that if they were asked <laughs> to talk about what has ever happened to them. They would mention major things, but uh, um, for gay people, I've seen this uh, in, in uh, brought up many times. There are other types of things uh, that uh, gay people report uh, that, again, might be uh, minor under some circumstances, such as uh, maybe treated in a very unfriendly way by one's partner's parents. So, 
Oh, and, and certainly it would not be a nice thing for anybody, uh, but, but for a gay person that may have uh, or that does have a very great social meaning of, again, echoing the, the rejection and, and uh, uh, um, disrespect that and, and the, 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 they have felt in the past and they continue to feel in society. So that is the relationship between the social meaning and those minor events. There was some uh, Dr. Meyer, you mentioned forms. What kind of forms are you talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, the testimony that was given here that uh, they talked about forms. What I mean by forms are just any kind of uh, administrative forms that one might have to fill, and, and in particular where you have to fill your marital status, for example. So uh, a gay person, uh, let's say, um, you know, really what the experience is, there's no place for me to to put anything there. So either they would say, well, I'm just going to say uh, single, even though I've been in a relationship for the past 40 years, because I just don't want to get into that. In this case, it really doesn't matter. Maybe I'm in a motor vehicle office, and I don't want to get into this whole explanation with a clerk about what does it mean that it, or there might be, I think one of the plaintiffs mentioned crossing out things and writing in things. Uh, but my point is, obviously, this is not very demanding to cross out a form and to say something else. And, and, and I would say that if it was within any other context, uh, nobody would remember that maybe the form was not very well written and you had to correct something there. That would not be a memorable event. The only reason that it's memorable is because, as I said, of what it means. And what it means is social rejection. It echoes the kinds of rejections that I've been describing earlier. Dr. Meyer, to follow up on this, to be sure I understand, you might have applications like at a bank to open an account or a lease to get an apartment or a job application. Is that the kind of form you're talking about where there are boxes to describe your status and not a box that corresponds to your status if you're not married? Absolutely. Uh, there was also some testimony on Monday, I believe, about hassles relating to travel, say, trying to check into a hotel room and get the type of room you reserved. Would that be? That's a, this is a very similar again, where um, to me it's not so much what happened, but what does it mean to you, to you as a gay person. So uh, again, a clerk in a, in a uh, hotel uh, asking you about a king size bed uh, for any couple would really mean nothing, uh, but for a gay person uh, it's an area of great sensitivity because it's really talks to their rejection and to the rejection of their family members, the people that they feel close to. Does the fact that you might draw in a box or ultimately get the right size bed make the problem go away for that individual? No, not at all, because again, it is not about anything tangible here. It's not, you know, there's nothing really horrible about filling out a form. Well, some form. <laughs> there can be. But, um, uh, at least small forms, <laughs> but 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 again, it is not about that uh, uh, effort of the filling out a form or explaining even to a clerk something about to clarify maybe some mistake. That is not what it's about. It's about I'm gay and I'm not accepted here. You also talked and I think gave some specific examples about non-events. Uh, these, although they're called non-events, are also in the research treated as prejudice events. Right. I mean, it's it's not they're not all treated as prejudice events, but when they are related to prejudice, then I would call them prejudice non-events. You know, but they, but they're, but they're uh, so. For example, somebody may not get a job promotion uh, just because of all kinds of circumstances that they would they maybe everybody expected them to get. Uh, so that may not be due to prejudice, but it also could be due to prejudice. Uh, 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 certainly somebody might not marry for all kinds of reasons, uh, uh, not because of anybody uh, uh, blocking their access to the institution of marriage, but for whatever other circumstances in their lives. But it is still would be a non-event that could be significant because uh, other people will begin to ask, well, are you married? When are you married? Especially if they're of certain 
ethnic backgrounds um, where, where people <laughs> ask questions like that. So there's expectation that you will get married, that you will have children. And um, so when I talk about those as prejudice, it is when those things don't happen because of prejudice. And again, parallel to everything else I was saying, in this case it would have that double meaning, both the impact of the, uh, the actual event, the content of the actual event, or in this case non-event, such as not getting married. But for gay men and lesbians, not getting married would also have that social meaning that I just described regarding uh, daily hassles type of things, where uh, not getting married is not just uh, uh, a simple, um, it's not really simple either way, but, but, but it's not um, a effect of their lives, it's also a representation of their position in society, of the way society views them, of the kind of respect, or in this case, disrespect that they experience, and of the stigma in, that I described earlier. Now, Dr. Meyer, what, if anything, is the relationship between Proposition 8 and the denial of the right to marry, on the one hand, and prejudice events, as you described? Well, I, uh, I think it is um, quite obvious that Proposition 8, uh, by definition, blocks uh, the marriage institution uh, for gay men and lesbians. This is basically what it says. Uh, so um, in that sense, it um, certainly will be responsible for gay men and lesbians not marrying and having to explain why I have not married. And by explaining why I have not married, you also have to explain I'm really not seen as equal. I'm, 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 my, my status is, is, is uh, not respected by my state or by my country, by my fellow citizens. So, um, the, so, so, so it's in the very basic definition of structural stigma, it is a block on the way to achieving desirable uh, goals in life. Now, you've already talked a little bit about some of the plaintiff testimony on uh, Monday. I was hoping that I could show you a, a couple examples. Do, do we have demonstrative four, Andy? And again, so that the record is clear as to what you're commenting on, let, let me read this testimony from plaintiff Paul Katami. Uh, question, have you experienced discrimination as a result of being gay? Answer, one example that I remember very clearly is the first time in college with some gay friends going to my first gay establishment like a bar or a restaurant socially. And we were in an outdoor patio and rocks and eggs came flying over the fence of the patio. We were struck by these rocks and eggs and there were slurs. And again, we couldn't find, we couldn't see me, who the people were, but we were definitely hit. And it was a very sobering moment because I just accepted that as, well, that's part of our struggle. That's part of what we have to deal with. In the context of prejudice events, do you have a reaction to this example? Yes, and as I said before regarding form, this, this, this just uh, seems like a very uh, familiar uh, type of uh, report that a gay person might uh, uh, report. And, and I, don't, I, I don't mean to, to uh, um, tell the plaintiff that their experiences are not unique experiences. Certainly within their lives they are unique, but uh, uh, they're really not unique. Uh, many people, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, many people experience those kind of things. And um, I think when I read that, what struck me most, almost maybe not what you would notice, but it is that point about it was a very sombering moment because I think that refers to the registration about this is a meaningful point. This is about who I am. This is something that I have to get used to. Uh, when uh, uh, Mr. Katami talks about, well, that's part of our struggle. It is really a moment where he describes recognizing something that has to do with who he is as a gay person. But other elements of this uh, would be uh, that uh, clearly I would say this was related to hate. Uh, in fact, when uh, we assess, the, by the way, when we collect those narratives in my research, uh, we go through a very, very tedious process of analyzing each of those 
narrative so that we can quantify some qualities around them. And one of the things we look at in, uh, related to hate crime, and we actually uh, try to, to uh, uh, use some of the um, guidelines that police uh, uses in determining hate crime. So in this case, uh, uh, he mentioned being next to a gay establishment, which would be uh, one element that would um, help in determining a hate crime. Uh, but um, there's something that I don't know here, for example, whether somebody was actually hurt, which would go to the issue of the magnitude. But regardless of that, I think what is clear here that the meaning of this, and I would dare say not having talked to Mr. Katami and not, not really knowing anything behind that, that perhaps one of the main reasons that is so memorable was because of that sombering moment, because of that recognition. Um, I am not the same as other people in society. Somebody can come and just throw stones or whatever it was and eggs on me because they don't like that I'm gay. And w when you were talking earlier about whether or not this was unique, do you mean that this sort of example is in your research often relayed by gay men and lesbians? Exactly. Let's put up a demonstrative five, another example. And this is a testimony from another of our plaintiffs, uh, Sandy Steer. Question, are there occasions where you have to fill out forms that ask whether you're married or name of spouse or things like that? Answer, doctor's offices, are you single or are you married or are, you know, divorced even? But, you know, so I have to find myself, you know, scratching something out, putting a line through it and saying domestic partner and making sure I explain to folks what that is to make sure that our transaction can go smoothly. We talked a good bit about forms already, but what, what's your reaction? Again, that's, that's again an example of this form, but, uh, you know, you have to think, you, you, or I guess you have to ask yourself, why would a person remember that type of minor incidents? And as I mentioned before, I think the meaning of these incidents is more important than in this case what had actually happened. Uh, uh, so, um, like I said, if, if, if there was some error on this form where it says uh, Mr. or Mrs. and somehow the, the words were not clear and, and, and she had to fix that, I don't think she would have reported that uh, as, as, a, as a major uh, <laughs> something that she remembers, uh, I, but I think it is again the, the, the message that the forms in a sense echoes about rejection and about um, I'm not equal to other people, to most people who fill this form. Well, let's, let's move to the second process you talked about, expectations of rejection and discrimination. What do you mean by that? Expectations of rejection and discrimination um, I actually mean exactly what it says, um, expecting rejection and discrimination. But this is a very, um, well, to me, interesting uh, process that occurs in um, uh, populations that are, uh, that, that are used to prejudice. And by, by used, I mean that they know about the prejudice that exists in society. And what happens is that a person who knows that they might be rejected or discriminated against needs to maintain a certain vigilance about their interactions in society that would, first of all, guarantee their safety. So an example that I often use uh, when I talk about this is a, a, a gay couple walking down the street. In my experience, very often, regardless of how friendly the street is, uh, they would have to monitor the kind of affection that they display with each other because perhaps somebody will come and throw stones and eggs and so forth because they bring up something uh, that the person uh, doesn't like. And, and, and again, they, it's not something about them as individuals, but about the fact that they are representing, uh, or sorry, presenting as gay. Uh, so, so this would be one type of, uh, as I call it, vigilance, that you have to be on edge, you have to watch, you have to have a third eye looking, monitoring your environment. And that is a very stressful thing if you think about it, uh, that many people don't have to think about any of that when they walk down the street with now, their partners. Does the impact of expectation of rejection discrimination go away 
If the rejection or discrimination doesn't happen? If the rejection or discrimination doesn't happen? Well, well that's another interesting thing uh, about uh, expectation of rejection and discrimination is that nothing really has to happen. And not only that, the persons involved in, the, in that uh, uh, environment may themselves not at all hold any negative attitudes. So in, the, in a sense, it is the expectation is not that this particular person may harm me. It is that what I represent may trigger in somebody, and it could be this person, but maybe it's not. So, so it doesn't have to be about anything specific about the persons involved in this interaction. Um, I often give the example of being in a job interview and having to kind of monitor uh, maybe how your what you're saying, and, and, and it doesn't mean it doesn't matter what the people interviewing you actually think. It is that you're expecting that that matters. That is what is stressful here. Um, in addition to issues of safety, there are, as I just alluded to, issues around social intercourse where. Um, things can just be very embarrassing or awkward. And we know from stress literature in generally that many times people choose to either avoid those situations, swallow <coughs> kind of minor incidents of, of prejudice or, 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 or slurs or something and just kind of move on because they don't want to get into that, so to speak. Uh, but, but the anticipation itself is what I'm talking about as stressful you know, whether something or not happen, as I said, that's, that has to do with the life events, but here we're just talking about that anticipation. So what if somebody concerned about having to be vigilant on the street just stays inside and doesn't go out? Does that solve the problem? <laughs> well, that would be uh, quite a severe punishment for that person. Is there a relationship, as you see it, Dr. Meyer, between Proposition 8's denial of the opportunity to marry and this expectation of rejection and discrimination? Uh, yes. What is that connection? Well, as I described earlier, in my mind, the Proposition 8, in its social meaning, sends a message that gay relationships are not to be respected, that they're of secondary value if of any value at all, that they're certainly not equal to those of heterosexuals. And to me, that in addition to achieving the, the, the literal aims of not allowing gay people to marry, it also sends a strong message about the values of the state, in this case, the Constitution itself. And it sends a message that would, in my mind, encourage, or at least is consistent with, holding prejudicial attitudes. So that doesn't add up to a very welcoming environment. Let's talk about the third process you identify, which I think you described as concealing the stigmatizing identity. Can you? Yes. Elaborate? Yes. Um, <coughs> if I may just mention one more concept. <laughs> that is related to the stress, as we call it, the stress process, because it's relevant here. Um, and that is the concept of coping. Coping is part of the stress process. And when we assess how does the stress affect the outcome, as I mentioned earlier, of health outcome, we really look at the balance between the stress impact and what we call coping. This, 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 a whole bunch of stuff that goes into coping. People talk about social support. But it is anything that we can say is positive impact on the health that counters the negative impact of the stressor. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up here because interesting thing about so, so So concealing means I'm not going to reveal to other people that I'm gay or lesbian. I'm going to hide that fact. But the interesting relationship with coping is that people conceal usually as a coping effort. They conceal so that they avoid some of the things that I described earlier, so that they're not fired from their job. 
Um, if you're in the United States military, by law you have to conceal in that you're not allowed to talk about your homosexuality, right? So, so they conceal as an effort to, in this case, if you are gay and you're in the military, you would conceal so that you're not getting fired. Um, but there are many other types of instances where people might find the need to conceal their sexual orientation. They may conceal it uh, because they feel that they would be rejected if other people knew that they were gay. They may conceal it because of their personal safety in a similar way that I described hate crimes, that they don't want people to uh, um, recognize them as gay. They might not want to go to a place that is recognized as gay for fear that somebody may either hurt them or, or, or either physically hurt them or in other ways hurt them. So there are reasons that people choose to conceal what they themselves know uh, about themselves, that they're gay or lesbian. And um, what the stress process here talks, so this is just what it is, but what the stress process is, is um, that there are many ways that this kind of concealment are stressful. And um, I've written about uh, at least uh, maybe three ways, and again, all of this comes from research and literature that is not specific to this topic or to gay population. This is basing it on general uh, 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 literature in various fields, in this case uh, mostly psychology, uh, so if you want, I can tell you about the particular ways that concealing can be stressful. If, if you could briefly just identify what those ways are, it would be helpful. So, so one way is that uh, uh, concealing requires actually a very uh, strong cognitive effort. By cognitive, I mean uh, uh, the way we think or the way your mind works. Uh, so, so there's a stress that is involved with concealing because you have to really work hard on this. It's not something that is, you know, if you're lying, you kind of have, it's not that easy always to keep a lie and to keep it for certainly a prolonged period of time. So there's, there's research that has been done about that uh, um, that shows that this is in fact a very difficult type of thing. I know, uh, for example, well, I, I brought up the example of the military. If you're in the military and you, 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 you live your life there and you have to talk to your uh, 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 comrades and, and, and people talk about maybe their girlfriend and their boyfriend or whatever, and, and gay people have been known to maybe change the pronoun and, and kind of as a way of monitoring that and maybe say, yeah, my girlfriend, but you really mean your boyfriend. But, it, you know, this, this takes a lot of coordination and, and, you know, you have to remember what you said the week before. It's all a lie. So uh, people uh, have actually studied this with, uh, in other contexts, as I said. Uh, there's a couple of researchers that, that refer to that in their uh, uh, responses that they were studying. They said this is a private hell just that effort of concealing. The work that's involved. In the, wor the cognitive effort, and they describe in great detail the cognitive work that goes into concealing. In this case, it was in the work environment. Do, uh, can I ask a yeah. does the in addition to that, does the person who conceals also lose benefits that he or she might receive if he or she were able to express their true self? Right, so, 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 the, so that's another way uh, that, that uh, concealment is damaging and stressful. Um, so actually there's several benefits that are associated with that. The first one is that concealing prevents you from what we call or what people call in psychology expressed emotion. Expressed emotion is very simply that you're expressing your emotion, but it doesn't have to be any deep emotion, just expressing something about yourself. And that has been shown to be a very positive uh, uh, psychologically um, thing to do. In fact, people have used it as a, as a form of therapy uh, uh, to improve people's mental health. They've used it, for example, with cancer patients and shown that just writing something about expressing something, not even very intimate, is very helpful psychologically. So certainly hiding something and hiding something that is uh, uh, perceived as being such a core thing about who you are 
This is how people talk about it. This is who I am. Now, that doesn't mean that gay people are just that, but it is a central identity that is important. And if you want to express who you are, certainly you wouldn't want to hide that part. There's related to that also a concept of authenticity, of, of living an authentic life. And certainly people feel better in a kind of existential way about just presenting themselves as they are to the world and in interactions with the world. Does concealment impact a gay man or lesbian's ability to obtain social support? Exactly. That, as I mentioned earlier, one of the important mechanisms around stress and illness is the ability of people to cope with uh, stress. And one of the beneficials, uh, sorry, one of the beneficial ways that people cope with stress is through social support, for example, through having a network of friends that you can maybe talk about or an intimate friend that you can talk about things. There are also things that happen through for gay people specifically what we call affiliation with the gay community. There are things that maybe, you know, you feel maybe other people don't understand, but if you go to a certain a community center or to a center, uh, sorry, to an event that maybe is a, like a gay pride, that you get certain benefits from being in that environment that maybe you don't get in other places. And certainly if you are um, concealing your gay identity, you are not going to walk into a gay community center or a gay pride event. And, and finally, related to that, and especially of concern to me being in public health in terms of health services, there are many health services that are provided that provide, uh, uh, I would say, more targeted services to gay and lesbian populations that are uh, um, more both informed from a medical perspective, for example, about the needs of gay men and lesbian, and also that maybe provide a more a welcoming environment, and that too would be something that a person who conceals uh, his or her gay identity would not be able to benefit from. So they both uh, uh, are affected by the negatives, but also from the prevention of the positive type of thing that they could have had. Now, one point I want to clarify here, uh, can concealment be absolute in nature, meaning the person doesn't tell anyone ever what their identity is. I, I guess it uh, could be. I don't think that, uh, certainly it doesn't have to be that. Uh, um, and I would think that uh, many people, even if they, for example, conceal at work, they might have some friends <coughs> that they may have confided with. Uh, there's also concealment that occur in more kind of momentary more, uh, nature that is not as long-lasting as I was describing, and that too can have a uh, certainly is not a not a, a pleasant experience. You know, again because of the notion that you're really prevented from expressing something about yourself that you don't feel that you should. But the reason that you're uh, concealing it is because, again, of the significance of rejection, of, of derision, of, of, of disrespect that you would feel if you were to reveal this. So, so it is not just a simple uh, uh, issue or thing. And let me try and clarify the question. I believe there was some testimony from one of the plaintiffs on Monday about knowing that he was gay at a very, very young age, but not coming out, if you will, to anyone until about 25. Is that a form of concealment? Uh, it sounds like it, and, and uh, you know, to the extent that he knew that he was gay or he identified as gay at some earlier point and uh, uh, recognized that, or, or feared at least, that if he were to uh, reveal this or express this about himself uh, would would lead to, again, rejection, discrimination, uh, um, to losing maybe a relationship. So again, this is, I presume, what the person uh, uh, expected, and that was the motivation to maybe not reveal his sexual orientation. But alternatively, if somebody, let's say, were open with family or friends, but in particular circumstances chooses to conceal or lie about his or her orientation just to avoid having to deal with it. 
Is that also possible? That's another example. As I said, you know, uh, because of don't <coughs> ask, don't tell, you obviously if you're there you would have to conceal, uh, but only in that environment and you might be able to on home leave go back and be with your partner or with some friends. Certainly you're not going to want to, to march in a gay pride parade, so there will be still some monitoring, but it doesn't have to be absolute. Dr. Meyer, do you see a connection between the concealment process and Proposition 8 and its denial of marriage rights? Well, again, to the extent that we see Proposition 8 as part of a stigma, as something that propagates this stigma, uh, it certainly doesn't send a message that it's okay. <laughs> you can be who you want to be. You know, we respect that. We, we welcome you as part of the community. It sends the opposite message in my mind. And therefore, would, uh, I would think, um, add to that pressure, to that uh, uh, social environment that, that encourages people, some people, to conceal. And, and also, uh, when, when I talk about those effects of Proposition 8, by the way, they don't only affect gay people. They also send the same message to other people who are not themselves gay. So in that sense, it's, it's not just damaging to gay people because they feel bad about their rejection. It also sends a message that it is okay to reject, not only that it's okay, that it is very highly valued by our constitution to reject a, a gay people, to designate them a, a, a different class of people in terms of their intimate relationships. I'd like to show you another example of, of testimony from our plaintiffs. Um, this coming from uh, Chris Perry, testimony that was given on Monday. Again, I'll, I'll read it. Do you, as you go through life every day, feel that <coughs> other effects of discrimination on the basis of your sexual orientation? Answer, every day. Question, tell us about that. Answer, I have to decide every day if I want to come out everywhere I go and take the chance that somebody will have a hostile reaction to my sexuality or just go there and buy the microwave we went there to buy without having to go through that again. And the decision every day to come out or not come out at work, at home, at PTA, at music, at soccer is exhausting. So much of the time, I just choose to do as much of that as I can handle doing in any given day. Do you have a reaction to that testimony? Yeah, I think that, again, demonstrates several of the things that I've already mentioned, including the expectations of rejection and the need to monitor and, and, and maybe sometimes the, the need to decide, uh, do, do, is it worth it? Do I, do I want to get into this whole thing and, and, and or just avoid it? Uh, but uh, also the, the repetition of it, like how it, it really is in so many contexts. But... Um, I have to say the word that most jumped at me in this, it might be not the word that jumped at, at other people, is the word exhausting. And the reason that it jumped at me is because exhausting has a special meaning in stress uh, research. In fact, uh, one of the earliest uh, examples of stress research uh, was done by a, a researcher by the name of Hans Selye, S-E-L-Y-E. And um, he described something that he called the general adaptation syndrome. He studied animals, but his general adaptation syndrome basically echoes what I was just describing. There's a stressor, there is a coping, which he didn't call it a coping, but there's some adjustment period. But in his words, the end of that was exhaustion, so that the result of the stress process was exhaustion, and he studied animals, and, and, and in many cases, death of those animals that he studied. So, so it, it, when I saw that, that's kind of what it brought to my mind is Salih's general adaptation syndrome. Let's, let's turn, uh, Dr. Meyer, to the fourth process you described, uh, which you described as internalized homophobia. Tell me what you mean by that phrase. So when, uh, again, that's a, a word that there, there has been 
discuss in, in different uh, forms, uh, uh, but it really relates to the same thing in the different forms that it has been discussed in the literature. As again I mentioned, I used existing literature and internal homophobia has been something that has dis been discussed a lot in clinical psychological research, uh, uh, people who, who talked about how to treat gay patients. And one of the things they noted is that uh, perhaps a very central aspect of, of treating people who are troubled by whatever symptom that brought them to therapy is internalized homophobia. Internalized homophobia refers to the person who is gay or lesbian basically internalizing or taking in uh, uh, negative attitudes, negative notions that are existing in society that he or she has learned uh, through their uh, um, what we call socialization process through their growing up in our in this society. And of course it is not only gay, as I said earlier, gay uh, men and lesbians who learn those negative attitudes, those are prevalent attitudes. So in learning those attitudes, one might learn, you know, if, if they read this uh, book by Ruben that I mentioned about what gay relationships it might be. And then at some age, the person uh, um, begins to think or realize or recognize or, or whatever way uh, um, this happens, well, I am gay. So the natural thing is that everything that I've learned about what it is to be gay, that must be what I am. And therefore, if I was impacted by this quote from Ruben, for example, I would say that it would be quite devastating to a young or really not only young person if, if, if they believed that and thought, well, this is what is uh, in my future. <laughs> Now, w when you use the word internalized homophobia here, do you mean specifically that the person internalizes a fear of themselves? No, not at all. Uh, when I use the word homophobia, I use it in the sense of um, negative attitudes, uh, maybe something that is akin to racism or sexism. Just, just, And, and people use other words, uh, but uh, I use that word because... Uh, well, I have my reasons. I don't know <laughs> if you want to hear them. Uh, it's a word that is recognizable. It's a word that is in the dictionary, and uh, I find it uh, just as good a word as some other words that have been proposed. But it basically relates to the negative attitudes that are prevalent in society about gay men and lesbian or about homosexuality in general. Now, within the concept, co context of internalized homophobia, are you aware of a concept called the possible self? Yes, I am, and it's not exactly within the context. It's, again, another concept or theory that I have used, borrowed, to explain some of those processes as they pertain to internalized homophobia. And what does it so mean? So possible self is a psychological concept uh, that... Again, I did not uh, uh, invent, unfortunately, and um, <laughs> because it is a very renowned uh, work. Uh, and um, it basically relates to something very interesting, which is that whoever we are, and, and, and it really relates to any age, um, we don't only look at where we are and where we were in our his past, but we also project into what we might become. So this is what they call the possible self. What, what would possibly could I become? Or what are the possibilities for me? Maybe you can talk about it like that. And, and, and the work on that showed that this is a very important construct, not only because um, it actually helps people chart a life course, a, a goals and so forth. Uh, uh, and it doesn't have to be like super uh, articulated, like a whole life plan. Just, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I will be a mother. You know, things like that. Uh, so the, the possible self is not only important because of how it projects to the future and how it maybe helps the person think about the future. It is also related to what people feel right now. And having a obviously more optimistic notion of their future will be associated with feeling better about who you are. And uh, the opposite of that, feeling uh, that you will be blocked from achieving 
goals obviously will be associated with what we call a lower sense of well-being uh, uh, and maybe uh, uh, just negative uh, uh, feelings about who you are and about your position. And does internalized homophobia lead to limitation on one's concept of the possible self? Uh, right, I'm sorry. So, so, so the relationship is that internalized homophobia speaks very directly to that notion of possible self because internalized homophobia conveys that there are certain attitudes, certain stereotypes, uh, uh, negative attitudes that is, that in the way that gay people have been portrayed, as I described earlier, related to social stigma, related to cultural portrayals, such as the Rubin, but certainly uh, it, is, it is just one example. So if you internalize that, you think this is who I'm going to be in the future. I mean, of course, it is not as simplistic as that, but that part of that is about uh, uh, how do I see my future? How do I see my prospects for the future? Who will I become? And we've seen that actually uh, in some research, gay and lesbian youth had a harder time projecting to the future because they've learned those kind of negative attitudes. In fact, they've had a harder time. Uh, uh, so, so at a very young age, uh, children, you know, it, the most accessible type of possible self, I think, is the kind of family relations that one describes, you know, a very young age, people will, might, uh, sorry, little kids might play and say, I'm the wife and I'm the mother, things like that. So, uh, so for gay uh, uh, youth or gay people, really, at whatever age they they begin to grapple with those issues, um, this is this is a difficulty. You know, you have to think, well, how would I be? Because is it true that you know, gay uh, uh, homosexuals are not happy together? Is it, it, it you? have to begin to, uh, uh, in a sense, undo some of those uh, effects and, and um, in a sense, relearn. And that was part of what the, the therapists were talking about. Relearn uh, better attitudes about yourself and about what it is like to be gay. Now, Dr. Meyer, I'd like to show you, um, if we could have demonstrative aid, another example of testimony from Monday from our plaintiffs, um, again from, from Chris Perry. Question. What does the institution of marriage mean? Why do you want that? Answer, well, I have never really let myself want it until now. Growing up as a lesbian, you don't let yourself want it because everyone tells you you are never going to have it. Do you have a reaction to that? I think that is a pretty perfect example of what I was just describing where the person recognizing uh, uh, herself, in this case, as a lesbian, uh, applies those notions that some of those things that are that are relevant to other people, such as uh, uh, um, um, marriage uh, here, uh, do not apply to me. I can't hope for that. That is not part of my possible self. And and I guess she's implying here, or presumably because of she, her being a plaintiff at some point, she began to recognize that, yes, this is something that I could possibly uh, uh, get access to as well. So that's exactly the process I was describing earlier. I'd like to move to your third and final opinion that you referenced earlier, um, having to do with uh, health outcomes. Uh, you've described the stigma attached uh, to being lesbian and gay and the role of minority stress in the lives of gay men and lesbians. Does that stigma and minority stress, according to the research, have an impact or effect on health outcomes for gay men and lesbians? Yes. What is that impact? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this entire endeavor, this, this whole stress process that I described, its purpose is to study uh, health determinants, as we call it, of health, the causes of health and disease. And there's been uh, uh, literally hundreds of studies that, that study different aspects of this and how it is associated with health outcomes. And we know that for gay men and lesbians and, and, and also bisexuals, there has been uh, um, shown a relationship between experiencing those kinds of stressors and negative 
health outcome or adverse health outcomes. In my area of study, those were mental disorders, such as uh, the three classes that we usually study in community studies. Those are uh, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, such as depression, substance use disorders. Uh, those are classified disorders. They're also just what we would call general distress or, or, or just feeling uh, something that's uh, blue and, and, and sad, things like that. So, uh, so there are a variety of outcomes that have been studied. On the other side of it, there's also been uh, health behaviors that are associated with um, stress uh, um, and this minority stress, for example, excess smoking, uh, um, certain eating behavior, drinking. Uh, and again, this is true for the general stress literature as well as for uh, gay and lesbian populations with the, with the, with the I guess, the point being that gay and lesbian populations are exposed to more of this stress and they're to distress, which is unique and additive to kind of the general stress that, as I mentioned earlier, everybody experiences, and therefore that excess uh, risk, as we call in epidemiological uh, language, that excess risk is associated with an excess uh, disease or disorder or whatever the outcome is. So as I said, it could be disorders, it could also be generalized distress. We've also studied something that's called well-being, which is some people refer to as a positive mental health. And there's also been uh, studies um, that show uh, excess in uh, suicide attempts, in particular in youth. And Dr. Meyer, does the research show that stigma and the minority stress that you've talked about contributes to a higher incidence of these adverse mental health consequences or the attempted suicide you talk about in the gay and lesbian population than in the population at large? Yes, so we, we, we look at the relationship between excess risk and uh, uh, to see whether it is related to excess in outcome, as we said, of the disease that we are studying. And uh, there's been pretty consistent findings uh, uh, that show uh, excess uh, disorder or, or higher level of disorder in gay lesbian populations as compared to heterosexuals. I, I want to be sure we're being clear on, on a couple of points. Are you saying that being gay or lesbian is in and of itself in any way a mental illness? No, not, not at all. What I'm saying is that there is risk that is associated with those social arrangements, with the social situation that I describe as stigma and prejudice, and that excess risk is related to excess, uh, as we call it, disorder or, or uh, to an outcome. It leads to a certain outcome and because it is excess, it leads to more of it in the population that is exposed to the risk. But when we study disorders and risk and outcome relationships, it is never uh, uh, expected that everybody who is exposed to a risk is therefore diseased somehow. I mean, even in the area of stress, people who are exposed to the most severe type of stressors, uh, um, like extreme stressors, we call them, like war, that doesn't mean that all of them are therefore uh, going to be affected with a disease such as PTSD. What we look at is the excess and the relationship between populations. As I said before, I study patterns of diseases, so we want to see, does this population have more of this risk and more of this disease. Uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's clear. And, and a related point I just want to be clear on. Are you saying that all gay men and lesbians suffer from some form of adverse mental health consequences, or even that most do? No. Again, w what we look to see is whether this exposure is related to the outcome among some people. I, I guess another... Uh, Analogy would be when we look at smoking and lung cancer. So we want to see do people who smoke have more lung cancer than people who don't smoke, and that would indicate uh, one indication of the association between those two. But it actually is not the fact that everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. They're 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 uh, going back to the gay and lesbian population. Most gay men and lesbians are not 
uh, uh, disordered, or, or, but, but there is an excess in that population as compared to heterosexuals. Do you have a view as to whether the incidence of adverse health consequences of the type you're describing would be less if we could find a way to reduce the stigma and minority stress experienced by gay men and lesbians? Yes, I think that it, it uh, stems from everything I was saying when we see um, people have more of this exposure, they have more of the disorder, and people who have less of this, ex this ex sorry, exposure have less of the disorder. So, for example, if we study within a group of, uh, uh, we call them respondents, so study participants, uh, and we see that some people may have had a lot of those life events and, and they were of great magnitude. And then we see that they have more of the outcome that we're studying, maybe depression. And then we see that some other people, for many reasons, didn't have that exposure. Maybe uh, for particular circumstances in, in their own environment, they were protected from that or whatever other reasons. And we see that they have fewer a, a lower level of this disorder. So that indicates that an more of those stressors are associated with more of the disease and by definition less of those stressors would be associated with less of that disease or the diseases that are affected by those things. Are you familiar with something called Healthy People 2010? Yes. What we that? actually refer to that as Healthy People 2010. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, and what is Healthy People uh, 2010? So uh, it's just that if you tell people Healthy People 2010, they would probably not know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, well, we just call it Healthy People 2010. Um, Healthy People is a project of the federal government uh, organized, or, or I guess I would say led by the Department of Health and Human Services. And it is the uh, uh, plan for the nation's health for the decade that is coming uh, so actually right now we'll, we'll be looking for Healthy People 2020. So Healthy People 2010 is the plan for the health of the nation for the decade that started in 2000 and obviously is ending now. Do you have that in front of you, sir? Yes. And this is text from uh, Healthy People 2010? Yes. and and. Can I explain something about it? Sure. Okay, so Healthy People 2010, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and, and many, many, uh, this is a very long process that involves, uh, I don't know for exact, but, 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 but many, many, many uh, uh, professionals and um, researchers and, and, and so forth, both in government and outside of government. So. The main goals that, that uh, the United States set up for itself in terms of uh, health of the nation, one of the main goals was to reduce health disparities. Health disparities refer to differences between one population to another population where one population has more an excess of any kind of disorder, whether it's uh, uh, a mental or physical disorder. And this is a section from Healthy People 2010 that describes one of those populations, which is a population defined by sexual orientation, and it has identified them as a, one of our nation's goals to reduce disparities associated uh, uh, with, uh, in the health of gay and lesbian populations as compared to heterosexuals. So that's what this is. Okay. And let me just read so that, again, the record's clear what you're looking at. Uh, it says sexual orientation, America's gay and lesbian population comprises a diverse community with disparate health concerns. Major health issues for gay men are HIV, AIDS, and other sexually transmitted diseases, substance abuse, depression, and suicide. Gay male, gay male adolescents are two to three times more likely than their peers to attempt suicide. Some evidence suggests lesbians have higher rates of smoking, overweight, alcohol abuse, stress than heterosexual women. And then we've highlighted the last sentence. The issues surrounding personal, family, and social acceptance of sexual 
orientation can place a significant burden on mental health and personal safety. Uh, in your view, is this finding from Healthy People 2010 relevant to your own opinion as to health outcomes and their relationship to stigma and minority stress? I, I think it basically uh, describes what I was talking about today, and, and, and this is pretty much uh, what I'm describing. Can we also show the chart? Do we, so we have the chart? As we're reaching the end here, I want to just I put a chart up here, which begins with social structure and then has a box on top, coping resources, top in the middle, and then bottom middle, stress, general and prejudice related, and then on the right, health outcomes, disease. Can you explain what this chart depicts? Yes, uh, this is a very, very schematic, simple way of uh, basically demonstrating the causal chain that I was uh, describing to you today that goes from the left uh, uh, to the right with health outcomes being our outcome of interest. The social structure and social status are here to the left as determinants of stressors that people experience as well as coping resources. What we mean by that is that stress and coping resources are not randomly assigned to people in society, but they depend on their so on social structures. And it could mean something simple as if you're employed, you can get fired from your job, but if you're not employed, obviously you cannot have that kind of event. So, so events do not just happen in a random order. Specifically to the topics that I was discussing today, what it shows is the social status and the stigma uh, um, lead to exposure to specific stress uh, stressors, such as the ones that I described that I call minority stress, and I de described here uh, both general and prejudice related to indicate that uh, everybody experiences uh, general stressors, as I described them, or just plain stress. And then there's added prejudice related stress. And on the top, coping resources uh, relates to what I was describing before as the protective role of coping. And, and, and in coping, well, all of this is very simplistic, but there are a lot more behind each of those uh, um, uh, boxes, as we just discussed at length, the stress, uh, uh, for example. There's, there's a lot more that could be said about coping, for example, and social support is part of that. And, and it basically shows that what we look for is how does this whole process affect health outcomes. Dr. Mara, I just want to ask you uh, one last thing as we close here. Uh, do you have a view as to whether the mental health, health outcomes of gay men and lesbians in California would improve if Prop 8 were not the law of California and gay men and lesbians were permitted to marry? I do. What is that view? Um, I think consistent with everything that I've said and consistent with my um, work on the relevance of the social environment, of social structures, and consistent with findings that show that when people are exposed to more stress, they fare worse than when they're exposed to less stress. I think that if California, and, and also consider with the things that I said earlier in terms of the, the prospect, pers prescriptive elements of Proposition 8 of the law having a, a constitutional amendment that basically says, you know, to gay people, you're not welcome here. Um, that the opposite of that clearly would send a positive message. You are welcome here. Your relationships are valued. You are valued. We don't approve with rejection Oh, sorry, we don't approve rejection of, of you as, as a gay person, as a state. And that has a very significant power, as we all know, the law and the state is a very important uh, uh, party to creating the social environment. So, uh, so clearly it's not the only thing that determines even experiences of prejudice and discrimination. Um, but it is certainly a very major 
player, a major, major factor in, in uh, creating this social environment that I described as, as prejudicial or stigmatizing. Honor, I have nothing further at this time. Very well. Why don't we take just 10 minutes, uh, Council, to uh, get ready for cross-examination. We seem to be falling a little behind our schedule, and so I'm going to suggest, if it's agreeable to, with Council, that we go a bit past 4.30 so that we can get in today everything that we'd anticipated getting in. Does that sound reasonable? Very well. Good. <laughs>